Let me just briefly, if I might, and, 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 and foolishly <laughs> say something about hurting instinct tests. I find them amazing. Can you imagine an obedience instinct test? Well, he doesn't do anything I say, but I think he could. <laughs> How about an agility instinct test? He leaps, he bounds. What is it? What is it? I don't know what a hurting instinct test tests. I honestly don't. He has the instinct to herd. And, you know, so I'm not a big hurting instinct test lover. I am a great proponent of of herding competitions in which dogs have to do things. And I think it's great that the AKC has gotten real involved in having lots of different breeds herd. I love that. It's just it's the instinct test, test that I just, I don't get it. You know, he has, he has the potential of being a confirmation champion. But he's not. <laughs> right? Anyway, we're going to play with dogs and we're going to play um, with space management and body block as part of our inquiry into current environment and how that influences a dog's behavior, I am always trying to get dogs to do what I want them to do without having to physically touch them for a whole variety of reasons. I think it, going at them like this elicits a lot of defensive aggression. It's also not effective when you're too far away. <laughs> and it's what everybody wants. Doesn't every family in the world want a dog who will come when they call, right? and lie down without having them to go, stand, go over and push the dog in a down. Hi, sweetie. So we have just a totally out of control dog here. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Hi, sweetie. You want to come up, Kathy? This is Kathy. Bless her heart. You want to introduce your, your first, our first demo dog here? First demo dog. This is Charlie Girl that we raised for guide dogs at the desert. She got disqualified for elbow dysplasia, and she's going to be four and still lab. And still lab. <laughs> Amazing how that works. Yes, always lab. Next year, she will, however, become a schnauzer. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Just totally. You want to just show us what she does? She's, she's had a lot of training, but she's not her big, you know, this is not the dog that, that she's Kathy. She's not my border collie, no. She's not her border, you know, she's, <laughs> she's not the dog, her standard poodle or her, you know, golden retriever. She's, she's not the dog who she's finished, right? And that's why I picked her. I wanted a dog who had some beginnings but wasn't like so done there was nothing to do, right? So would you just sort of play with her and show us what she knows? Um, just, just play with her, okay? So we can just be ethologists and just sort of sit and watch. And we're, we're not, we don't care, I don't care what she does. I don't care if she does it right or not. I just want to learn about her. Hi, sweetie. I, I don't think she needs the mic. How's her heel? Uh, fairly well, unless she's distracted by another dog. Okay, how's her or stay? Stay's good. Okay, try her, try, let's try her stay. Ooh, this is good. Oh, what a good dog. Good girl. Good girl. Well, she was wonderful. She was wonderful. And the only thing I don't like is that she was too wonderful. She wasn't this wonderful yesterday. <laughs> yesterday, she didn't do stay so well. I want to show you something, but now you're not going to be impressed because now she looks like she knows stay so well. So let me, just, let me just show you the way I do body blocks and stay. And, and maybe we can find a dog who's, who's um, I'll, we'll, we'll do it with her. And then maybe we can find a dog who's not quite as wonderful as you are. You're just such a good girl. You're such a good girl. So I just want to show you doing body blocks with stays. Boop, boop, boop. Sit. Stay. You know what, let's set up something really, really difficult. By the way, I always treat while they're staying, right? Went through that same process a couple of years of going, what was I thinking, you know? Why was I treating the release? <laughs> One of those simple, incredibly simple things that as soon as you learn it, you go like, 
where was I? You know, it's so obvious. Okay, good girl. Um, so let's, let's make this impossible for her and have you go in back of me and play bow for her to come. Stay. Okay, stop. Thank you. Good girl. Okay, good girl. There is this mommy. There's, so did you see what I did? I just body blocked her, right? I just got in her way, and I didn't have to touch her. And did I say anything? No. How many people, how many of you who train classes teach this in your classes? Cool, 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 cool. I know Trish is doing it now. Um, it all came from those border collies. It's really cool. Let's have somebody else do it. Who wants to do it? Great question. She said, why, and, and what would you suggest I pair with a body block? What signal? As, and, and what would it be in your case in this case? Okay, and, and that's a great inquiry she's brought up. Let's talk about that for a second. Is this just going to pause for a minute? She, she's asking a wonderful question, and I don't have the answer, I just have my answer. She's asking, why don't you, why didn't, when you body blocked, why didn't you use a verbal signal? And, and then we had a discussion about what verbal signal that would have been. There are a couple of reasons I don't. One, I don't say stay because what I want stay to mean to the dog is stay there in space. I don't care what posture they're in, so I don't do AKC sit stays. I think they're silly. Why don't you let the dog lie down and be comfortable for five minutes? You know? um, so I don't do postures. I do locations in space stays. Say I say this dog to stay. Let's just sort of play for a minute. And I am going to suck you into this in a minute. Charlie, come. Stay. Let's imagine she breaks and sure. Uh, stay. Okay. Good girl. Okay. Think put yourself in her position. You don't know the game, right? You're learning football, you've never seen it played, you don't know the goal. You have no idea what somebody wants. You're living on an alien planet. Somebody says stay, and you pause for a little bit, and then you get up, and then they say stay again. What are you gonna learn from that? I don't know, but here's a theory that I have. I think if they break and you say sit or stay again, it's like you're starting over. So say I said, what a good, you're such a good girl. Sit, stay. And she broke. Uh, and, and I said, sit, stay. What did I just do? I just started over. OK, good girl. I just started over again. And I don't think you're conveying the information you wanted which was what you did was wrong and stays not over until you say okay. You following me? You're looking, ooh, there's a big brow wrinkle. Concentration wrinkle. Is it? Yep. Do you agree or disagree? I agree. You agree? Well, I'm sure some of you disagree. It's, I, it, there's no truth. I, it's fine. I don't care. I'm just wondering about the us because I tend to go uh, uh, and use the forward. I, you know, I use my no is often ah, uh, ah. Uh, uh. And, and there are actually times I use it when I don't want to. It's become so involuntary. Have you noticed that? You run into people and you go, ah, and they go like, <laughs> right? Have you gotten into a little social trouble at doors, right? Have you done that? You turn it, you, you got a lot of dogs and a lot of people, you got visitors, right? And you go, wait. And three people urinate. Oh no, I didn't mean you. It's a problem in dog, and you know, it's actually a serious problem with the space management stuff. Because any of you work with dogs, most of you do this all the time, whether you know it or not, but I think most of you know all about it. But haven't you noticed that you use your body differently in space now? You sort of have to be careful, you know? You get some really rude salesperson, and they're really, really rude, and they say something to you, and you go, yes, well, did you want to? You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, well, I better be careful. Um, so here's my theory. 
no research, take it or leave it, think about it, is that because it's so confusing to be a receiver of a game that you don't know the goal or the rules of, we have to do everything we can to be clear. One of the things ethologists do and love to do is study communication. So one of the things I did, by the way, as an ethologist is study primate communication. And you learn a lot by listening to monkeys make noises and trying to figure out if eek, eek, eek means eek three times. I spent two years of your tax money trying to figure out if <laughs> eek, eek, eek means eek three times. And you know what? I never did. I don't know. That's how hard it is. And I'm supposed to be a member of the smart species. And I'm pretty smart. But it was not possible to really figure it out based on not being able to communicate and say, what do you know? What are you doing when you do that? So given that they don't know what a fine little dog you are, what, what I suggest is, is if they do the wrong thing, don't repeat the signal. You might give a verbal correction. I think a visual correction is all that's needed. I'll talk tomorrow and I'll show you research data that shows that visual overshadows acoustic. But it's almost impossible for me to stop the ah. <laughs> and I don't think it hurts anything as long as it's not too loud. But I really, I suggest that it's better to not start again because I honestly think that's confused them, confusing them. I also, and I, I know I'm, I'm I don't know if I'm alone on this, but I know there are a lot of people who don't do this. I never say, sit, good, sit, good, sit, good dog. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We'll bond over dinner. And the sit. Charlie, sit. What does sit mean? Okay. What does sit mean? Somebody quick. What does it mean? Sit. What does sit? Yeah, but what is it? You know. Put your butt on the floor, and what do you do with your forepaws? You keep them straight, right? Four paws straight, butt on the floor. That's what sit means. So the question is, is it a posture, or is it an action? Go home. Ask your dog, if it's not obedience trained, when it's sitting, to sit. Ask, you know how you have an obedience dog, and you have to proof sit from a lie down? Because it's not the same. One is sit down, the other is sit up. And they're different things. They're different actions. And I would argue that dogs think in terms of actions first. Of course, they can learn postures, but I think they think in terms of actions first. So if I say sit, I want my dog to stop what it's doing and do this. And if it's sitting and I say, good, sit, don't think they're linking those things together. What they're hearing is, good, sit. Right? Think about it. Okay, another reason you also mentioned, why wouldn't you say off? Say she jumped up or, or she broke her sit-stay. I don't say off either. I'm just a pain in the butt. I don't say off either. Does she ever jump up? Can I, can I mess her up? Can I bait her to do it? Would you mind? Oh, sweetie. Off. Good girl. Oh, sweetie. Oh, pop, pop. oh sweetie. Off. Good girl. Oh, sweetie. Bup, 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 bup. Oh, Charlie. Bup, bup. Oh, I did a good girl. Off. So every time she jumped up and I said off, and what'd she do? And she got off. What did she learn about jumping up? <laughs> Nothing. I jump up, she says off. Okie dokie. <laughs> off. Okie dokie. I jump up, I get off. I jump up, I get off. I jump up, I love this game. It's a, why are you mad at me? You people are crazy because now you're yelling at me. You never told her anything about jumping up. You said, you said, if you say off when they're up here, you said, now that you're here, please get off. And she said, okie dokie. So if a dog is jumping up on me and I don't want them to, I would give a body block and or say, ah. So I would say no. So I'm so rude. I call her up and then I go, chatter, 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 chatter. You want to play? 
Let's watch her body blocking. I'm going to get behind you just to make it interesting. She had to stay. I couldn't see. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Good, good. Good. And you know what I loved about what she did? Beeper? Somebody drug deal go through? <laughs> I teach at a university. <laughs> um, what I loved about what she did was that when Charlie started giving to her, she took the pressure off, just like Luke took the pressure off that you. And have you found when you first teach body blocks that, that the inherent yes. sort of deep, yes, yes. And the dog is like, Ugh. I loved when she stopped. It was a great decision she made about when to stop. That was really good. Let's do it again. Hey. Yes? Let's, do you want me to face another way? What, you don't, you don't want our hind ends? Hi, <laughs> sweetie. Nice block. I'm going to go to, on the left side of you now. OK. And, and, and you were a tiny bit late, right? Yeah. Wonderful effort. Tiny bit late. Happens to every one of us. One of the things that sheep herding dogs teach you is about is, is if you want a lot of control of an individual in front of you, you need, ironically, to be farther away from them. Right? It's sort of a geometrical exercise. So if you say stay and back up a step, you act, see how you now can actually control more space? Right? So let's try it again. Okay. Good girl. And release. OK. OK, good girl. Good girl. So that was a bit better. How would you coach her? Right? We're all looking for coaches. What would you say was great? She was really good. To release. In the, in, in the interim between the decision and the spoken word, the dog breaks. And so as they break, you say, OK, except they beat you. And you're just doomed. <laughs> you know? it's just, and it just happens, right? It's why positive reinforcement is so great, because you get all this slop. But um, I am very conscious with dogs that they don't gain space. Whoever, whoever there you are, that they don't gain space on me. So if, if I say stay and they break, I am absolutely committed to getting them back in space to where they were. Good girl. Good girl. Uh, good girl. <laughs> good girl. <laughs> Trying alternate behaviors. Boop, 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 boop. No, too bad she doesn't like food. Stay. I don't want to screw this dog. Stay up. Girl. Uh, uh. Good girl. Good girl. So again, OK, <laughs> covering your butt. <laughs> but cover your butt OK, right? Don't you love it? So I, I see this as the perfect example of a combination of ethology and learning. Because obviously, Charlie has learned a lot over time. I don't mean just right now, about staying in space and not moving. What a good dog. What a good girl. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Our first volunteer. I think that's really great. Oh, she wants to come back. She wants to come back. Um, doing in time is, is, let me ask a question before we take a break, make some decisions. Um, Randy was going to go get Maggie. Is Randy around? Hey, hey, there you are. Upper. And so, and, and I need some volunteers. And, and again, your job as a volunteer is just to start the conversation. You don't need to do it perfectly. I don't expect to do it perfectly all the time. <laughs> do you really? Or was that like coercive? <laughs> you want to? I do need a volunteer. You want to? <laughs> Yay. OK. Jim here, too. Um, she was a little nervous when I took her by the cages of the other dogs. So could you actually move the husky back a little bit, just, just to keep it sort of dog clear up here? Um, maybe he's going all the way over there. Why don't we 
Why don't we start with a husky? Sorry. I, was, I, I thought she was right out there. So why don't you just leap your little husky in? Hopefully he won't just let Maggie come running in off leash. So would somebody guard the door and just make sure we don't all of a sudden have two dogs running into each other by surprise? Um, so this is Annie, bless her heart. She's here at the Marin County Humane Society. And this is her dog, Canuti. Canuti. Here, and Canuti, everybody Canuti, knows Canuti, Canuti, so he's going to. Hi, the sweetie. Crowd. Hi. Ooh, freebies, freebies. Ooh, freebies, good boy. And Annie was telling me that he's, he, she hasn't worked on his heel very much. You know, he's got sort of the beginning basic heel concept, but it's not precise. <laughs> One would not call it precise. Why don't you just show us sort of where oh, he is? Just what, just yeah, however you want to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's good. <clears throat> so, so let me show you, and maybe you guys do this. Do you guys, do you all use body blocks on healing? Yes, 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 who does? You want to do it? Come do it. Oh, come on. Do you use body blocks on healing? Do I? Yeah. Occasionally. Occasionally? Do you? Just depends. Just to keep them off? Oh, this dog knows you. Are we talking about the same thing? Just I don't know. Using, using body language? Let's find out. Okay. Teach this dog to heal. <laughs> don't you love it how I'm not doing anything now? Yeah, and you know, Annie has to go hide. I'll be right back. It's okay. <laughs> Moody. Here's a nice body block. Good. <laughs> Good boy. Good boy. Yeah. What? What? Nope. So you start, you say you don't, she, he asked what about an outside turn, she says she doesn't start outside yet with this dog at this, con, at this place. So would you use, would you use food treats? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, you want some? Yeah, it's exactly what I'm talking about. Cool. Good boy, good. See how he's watching her now? The treats have nothing to do with it. Good, good. Good dog. Very nice. <coughs> Very nice. I have a little underbite. Cute. Yes, yes. Darling little big lip here. Canoody. Canoody. That's what I meant by body blocks. Do you guys do that? A little bit? So what I meant was, what I love to do, and some of you do this and some of you don't. So if you do this and this is like snore, just hang in there, okay? Because some people don't do it. Um, basically, the idea is that you're going to use space management and you're going to block the forward motion of a dog with your body without using, if at all possible, the leash. Good boy. Good boy. Oh, good boy. Good boy. Good boy. I do do this right away. Good boy. Good. Oh, good, 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 good dog. Boop, boop. Good boy. Good boy. Oh, I'm getting bored. Boop, boop. Boop, boop, boop. Oh, good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Uh, uh. Where's mom? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to reinforce you over here. <laughs> We're not. Yeah, it's a great question. If you have a major forger, which actually he is. He is. <laughs> well, it works. Really. That's why I said I wouldn't ever start with outside circles with him. Because he forges? The, the only, the, the exception I would make to that, you're getting worried about mom. He really is worried about mom. Is this. See how tight? Yes. And, and see, I think part of getting this is, is not just a treat, and maybe that's not true. I have this belief that if you, whew, 
<laughs> you can do this too much. I have this belief that if you bend your knees and move this way, that it has a profound effect on keeping them tight to you. Canoody. Uh-oh. Wait a second. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good dog. Good dog. Good dog. So I do that right away, but I'm really careful to bend my knees and turn this way. And you're lowering too. And I'm lowering him. So again, it's combining relevant ethological visual signals. They're a cursorial predator. You get a great chase response, plus good operant conditioning. Oh, that dog. Yeah. What would you do about that dog? What would you do, would you hold, since you know him for a second. What would you do about the husky? Yeah, he's really worried about mom. He knows Jim, so maybe he'll be a little better. What would you do about the husky who doesn't care about food? Oh, shoot. Well, there's a squeaky. I use a lot of squeakies on dogs who don't care about food. And usually the dogs who, quote, don't care about food do when you find the right food if they're not anxious. So say you get one of those dogs in class who no matter what you have, you have like a live mouse, you know, and it's not working. You know, <laughs> honest, I don't use live mouse. Um, but you have something incredibly compelling and the dog won't touch it. Usually that means the dog's too anxious. That's a side effect of too much adrenaline production. That means the dog shouldn't be in that context. So that dog often gets private lessons rather than class. Are we, are we traumatizing Canuti? Yeah, a little bit. I was, I was going to ask them to work this dog, but I'm not going to because I'm going to ask you to work the next dog, okay? He'll be more of a challenge. He'll be more of a challenge, Maggie? Yeah, yeah she'll be more. I'm going to have them work the dog after the break because I think we should stop right here, don't you? Yes. Hi, sweetie. Hi, sweetie. Okay, let me, would you take him out to mom? Yeah, yeah. Let me just briefly, if I might, and, 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 and foolishly, <laughs> say something about herding instinct tests. I find them amazing. Can you imagine an obedience instinct test? Well, he doesn't do anything I say, but I think he could. <laughs> How about an agility instinct test? He leaps, he bounds. What is it? What is it? I don't know what a herding instinct test tests. I honestly don't. He has the instinct to herd. And, you know, so I'm not a big herding instinct test lover. I am a great proponent of, of herding competitions in which dogs have to do things. And I think it's great that the AKC has gotten real involved in having lots of different breeds herd. I love that. It's just it's the instinct test, test that I just, I don't get it. You know, he has, he has the potential of being a confirmation champion, but he's not. <laughs> right. Anyway, we're going to play with dogs, and we're going to play um, with space management and body block as part of our inquiry into current environment and how that influences a dog's behavior. I'm always trying to get dogs to do what I want them to do without having to physically touch them for a whole variety of reasons. I think it... Going at them like this elicits a lot of defensive aggression. It's also not effective when you're too far away. <laughs> and it's what everybody wants. Doesn't every family in the world want a dog who will come when they call, right, and lie down without having them to go, stand, go over and push the dog in a down? Hi, sweetie. So we have just a totally out of control dog here. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Hi, sweetie. You want to come up, Kathy? This is Kathy, bless her heart. You want to introduce your, your first, our first demo dog here? First demo dog. This is Charlie Girl that we raised for guide dogs at the desert. She got disqualified for elbow dysplasia, and she's going to be four, and still lab. And still lab. <laughs> Amazing how that works. Yes, always lab. 
Next year, she will, however, become a schnauzer. <laughs> hey, sweetie. This is totally. You want to just show us what she does? She's, she's had a lot of training, but she's not her big, you know, this is not the dog that, that she's Kathy. She's not my border collie, no. She's not her border, you know, she's, <laughs> she's not the dog, her standard poodle or her, you know, golden retriever. She's, she's not the dog who she's finished, right? And that's why I picked her. I wanted a dog who had some beginnings but wasn't like so done there was nothing to do, right? So would you just sort of play with her and show us what she knows? Um, just, just play with her, okay? So we can just be ethologists and just sort of sit and watch. And we're, we're not, we don't care, I don't care what she does. I don't care if she does it right or not. I just want to learn about her. Hi, sweetie. I, I don't think she needs the mic. How's her heel? Okay, how's her stay? Stay's good. Okay, try her, try, let's try her stay. Ooh, this is good. Oh, what a good dog. Good girl. Good girl. Well, she was wonderful. She was wonderful, and the only thing I don't like is that she was too wonderful. She wasn't this wonderful yesterday. <laughs> yesterday, she didn't do stay so well. I want to show you something, but now you're not going to be impressed because now she looks like she knows stay so well. So let me just, let me just show you the way I do body blocks and stay. And, and maybe we can find a dog who's, who's um, I'll, we'll, we'll do it with her, and then maybe we can find a dog who's not quite as wonderful as you are. You're just such a good girl. You're such a good girl. So I just want to show you doing body blocks with stays. Boop, boop, boop. Sit. Stay. Good girl. You know what? Let's set up something really, really difficult. By the way, I always treat while they're staying right? Went through that same process a couple of years of going, what was I thinking? You know, why was I treating the release? <laughs> One of those simple, incredibly simple things that as soon as you learn it, you go like, where was I? You know, it's so obvious. Okay, good girl. Um, so let's, let's make this impossible for her and have you go in back of me and play bow for her to come. Stay. Okay, stop. Thank you. Good girl. Okay. Good girl. There's this is mommy. There's, so did you see what I did? I just body blocked her, right? I just got in her way, and I didn't have to touch her. And did I say anything? No. How many people, how many of you who train classes teach this in your classes? Cool. Cool, 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 cool. I know Trish is doing it now. Um, it all came from those border collies. It's really cool. Let's have somebody else do it. Who wants to do it? Great question. She said, why, and, and what would you suggest I pair with a body block? What signal? Well, that would be whatever you, whatever you want to tell the dog. As, and, and what would it be in your case in this case? OK. And, and that's a great inquiry she's brought up. Let's talk about that for a second. Is this just going to pause for a minute? She, she's asking a wonderful question, and I don't have the answer, I just have my answer. She's asking, why don't you, why didn't, when you body blocked, why didn't you use a verbal signal? And, and then we had a discussion about what verbal signal that would have been. There are a couple of reasons I don't. One, I don't say stay, because what I want stay to mean to the dog is stay there in space. I don't care what posture they're in, so I don't do AKC sit stays. I think they're silly. Why don't you let the dog lie down and be comfortable for five minutes? You know? um, so I don't do postures. I do locations in space stays. Say, I say this dog to stay. Let's just sort of play for a minute. And I am going to suck you into this in a minute. Charlie, come. Sit. <laughs> stay. Let's imagine she breaks. And... 
Sure. Uh, stay. Okay. Good girl. Okay. Think, put yourself in her position. You don't know the game, right? You're learning football. You've never seen it played. You don't know the goal. You have no idea what somebody wants. You're living on an alien planet. Somebody says stay, and you pause for a little bit, and then you get up, and then they say stay again. What are you going to learn from that? I don't know, but here's a theory that I have. I think if they break and you say sit or stay again, it's like you're starting over. So say I said, what a good, you're such a good girl. Sit, stay. And she broke. Uh, and, and I said, sit, stay. What did I just do? I just started over. OK, good girl. I just started over again. And I don't think you're conveying the information you wanted, which was what you did was wrong. And stays not over until you say OK. You following me? You're looking, ooh, there's a big brow wrinkle. Is it? Yep. Do you agree or disagree? I agree. You agree? I'm sure some of you disagree. It's, I, it, there's no truth. I, it's fine. I don't care. I'm just wondering about the us, uh, because I tend to go uh, uh, and use the more words. I, you know, I use my no is often ah, uh, ah. Uh, and, and there are actually times I use it when I don't want to. It's become so involuntary. Have you noticed that? You run into people and you go ah, uh, and they go like <laughs> Right? Have you gotten into a little social trouble at doors? Right? Have you done that? You turn it, you, you got a lot of dogs and a lot of people, you got visitors, right? And you go, wait. And three people urinate. Oh no, I didn't mean you. It's a problem in dog, and you know, it's actually a serious problem with the space management stuff. Because any of you work with dogs, most of you do this all the time, whether you know it or not, but I think most of you know all about it. But haven't you noticed that you use your body differently in space now? You sort of have to be careful, you know? You get some really rude salesperson, and they're really, really rude, and they say something to you, and you go, yes, well, did you want to? You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, well, I better be careful. Um, so here's my theory. No research, take it or leave it. Think about it. Is it? Because it's so confusing to be a receiver of a game that you don't know the goal or the rules of, we have to do everything we can to be clear. One of the things ethologists do and love to do is study communication. So one of the things I did, by the way, as an ethologist is study primate communication. And you learn a lot by listening to monkeys make noises and trying to figure out if ee, ee, ee means ee three times. I spent two years of your tax money trying to figure out if <laughs> ee, ee, ee means ee three times. <laughs> and you know what? I never did. <laughs> I don't know. That's how hard it is. And I'm supposed to be a member of the smart species. And I'm pretty smart. But it was not possible to really figure it out based on not being able to commute and say, what do you know? What are you doing when you do that? So given that they don't know what a fine little dog you are, what, what I suggest is, is if they do the wrong thing, don't repeat the signal. You might give a verbal correction. I think a visual correction is all that's needed. I'll talk tomorrow and I'll show you research data that shows that visual overshadows acoustic. But it's almost impossible for me to stop the ah. Uh, <laughs> and I don't think it hurts anything, as long as it's not too loud. But I really, I suggest that it's better to not start again, because I honestly think that's confused them, confusing them. I also, and I, I know I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm alone on this, but I know there are <clears throat> a lot of people who don't do this. I never say, sit, good sit, good sit, good dog. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. thank you. We'll bond over dinner. <laughs> and the sit. Charlie, sit. What does sit mean? OK. What does sit mean? Somebody quick. What does sit mean? Sit. What does sit? Yeah, but what is it? You know. 
Put your butt on the floor, and what do you do with your forepaws? You keep them straight, right? Forepaws straight, butt on the floor. That's what sit means. So the question is, is it a posture or is it an action? Go home, ask your dog if it's not obedience trained when it's sitting to sit. Ask, you know how you have an obedience dog and you have to proof sit from a lie down because it's not the same? One is sit down, the other is sit up. And they're different things, they're different actions. And I would argue that dogs think in terms of actions first. Of course they can learn postures, but I think they think in terms of actions first. So if I say sit, I want my dog to stop what it's doing and do this. And if it's sitting and I say, good, sit, don't think they're linking those things together. What they're hearing is, good, sit. <laughs> right? Think about it. Okay, another reason you also mentioned, why wouldn't you say off? Say she jumped up or, or she broke her sit-stay. I don't say off either. I'm just a pain in the butt. I don't say off either. Does she ever jump up? Can I, can I mess her up? Can I bait her to do it? Would you mind? Oh, sweetie. Off. Good girl. Oh, sweetie. Oh, bup, bup. oh sweetie. Off. Good girl. Oh, sweetie. Bup, 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 bup. Oh, Charlie. Bup, bup. Oh, you're a good girl. Off. So every time she jumped up and I said off, and what did she do? And she got off. What did she learn about jumping up? Nothing. I jump up, she says off. Okie dokie. <laughs> off. Okie dokie. <laughs> Hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Charlie, Charlie. Off. Good girl. I jump up. I get off. I jump up. I get off. I jump up. I love this game. It's a, why are you mad at me? You people are crazy because now you're yelling at me. You never told her anything about jumping up. You said, you said, if you say off when they're up here, you said, now that you're here, please get off. And she said, okie dokie. So if a dog is jumping up on me and I don't want them to, I would give a body block and or say ah. So I would say no. So I'm so rude. I call her up and then I go chatter, 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 chatter. You want to play? Let's watch her body blocking. I'm going to get behind you just to make it interesting. Is she going to stay? I couldn't see. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Good, good. Good. And you know what I loved about what she did? Beeper? Somebody drug deal go through? <laughs> I teach at a university. <laughs> um, what I loved about what she did was that when Charlie started giving to her, she took the pressure off, just like Luke took the pressure off that you. And have you found when you first teach body blocks that, that the inherent yes. sort of deep, yes, yes. And the dog is like, Ugh. I loved when she stopped. It was a great decision she made about when to stop. That was really good. Let's do it again. Hey. Yes? Let's, do you want me to face another way? Oh, no. What, you don't, you don't want our hind ends? I'm <laughs> sweetie. Nice block. I'm going to go to on the left side of you now. OK. And, and, and you were a tiny bit late, right? Yeah. Wonderful effort. Tiny bit late. Happens to every one of us. One of the things that sheep herding dogs teach you is, about, is, is if you want a lot of control of an individual in front of you, you need, ironically, to be farther away from them. Right? It's sort of a geometrical exercise. So, if you say stay and back up a step, you act, see how you now can actually control more space, right? So let's try it again. Okay. Good girl. And release. Okay, okay, good girl, good girl. So that was a bit better. How would you coach her, right? We're all looking for coaches. What would you say was great? She was really good. Yeah, the only thing, like, the first time I noticed that she lost her balance, she sort of fell back a little bit, and Charlie 
to release. In the, in, in the interim between the decision and the spoken word, the dog breaks. And so as they break, you say, okay, except they beat you. And you're just doomed. <laughs> you know? it's just, and it just happens, right? It's why positive reinforcement is so great, because you get all this slop. But um, I am very conscious with dogs that they don't gain space. Whoever, whoever there you are. That they don't gain space on me. So if, if I say stay and they break, I am absolutely committed to getting them back in space to where they were. Good girl. Good girl. Uh, good girl. Good girl. <laughs> Trying alternate behaviors. Boop, 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 boop. No, too bad she doesn't like food. Stay. I don't want to screw this dog. Stay up. Girl. Uh -uh. Good girl. Good girl. So again, okay. <laughs> Covering your butt. <laughs> but cover your butt okay, right? Don't you love it? So I, I see this as the perfect example of a combination of ethology and learning. Because obviously Charlie has learned a lot over time, I don't mean just right now, about staying in space and not moving. What a good dog. What a good girl. Thank you. Yay! Our first volunteer. I think that's really great. Oh, she wants to come back. She wants to come back. Um, doing in time is, is, let me ask a question before we take a break, make some decisions. Um, Randy was going to go get Maggie. Is Randy around? Hey, hey, there you are. Upper. And so, and, and I need some volunteers. And, and again, your job as a volunteer is just to start the conversation. You don't need to do it perfectly. I don't expect to do it perfectly all the time. <laughs> do you really? Or was that like coercive? <laughs> you want to? I do need a volunteer. You want to? Yay, okay. Jim here too. Um, she was a little nervous when I took her by the cages of the other dogs. So could you actually move the husky back a little bit? Just, just to keep it sort of dog clear up here. Um, maybe he's going all the way over there. Why don't we, why don't we start with the husky? Sorry. I, was, I, I thought she was right out there. So why don't you just leap your little husky in? Hopefully he won't just let Maggie come running in off leash. <clears throat> so would somebody guard the door and just make sure we don't all of a sudden have two dogs running into each other by surprise? Um, so this is Annie, bless her heart. She's here at the Marin County Humane Society. And this is her dog, Canutie. Canutie. Here, and Canuti, everybody Canuti, knows Canuti, so he's going to Hi, sweetie. Hi. Ooh, freebies, freebies. Ooh, freebies, good boy. And Annie was telling me that he's, he, she hasn't worked on his heel very much. You know, he's got sort of the beginning basic heel concept, but it's not precise. <laughs> One would not call it precise. Why don't you just show us sort of where oh, he is? Just what, just yeah, however you want to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's good. <clears throat> so, so let me show you, and maybe you guys do this. Do you guys, do you all use body blocks on healing? Yes, yes, yes. Who does? You want to do it? Come do it. Oh, come on. Do you use body blocks on healing? Do I? Yeah. Occasionally. Occasionally. Do you? Just depends. Just to keep them off. Oh, this dog knows you. Are we talking about the same thing? Just I don't know. Using, using body language? Let's find out. Okay. Teach this dog to heal. <laughs> don't you love it how I'm not doing anything now? <laughs> yeah, and you know, Annie has to go hide. I'll be right back. It's okay. <laughs> Here's a nice body block. Good. <laughs> Good boy. Good boy. Yeah. What? What? Yep. Nope. <laughs> 
So you start, you say you don't, she, he asked what about an outside turn, she says she doesn't start outside yet with this dog at this, con at this place. So would you use, Boy. would you use food treats? Boy. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, you want some? Yeah, it's exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. Okay. Cool. Kadoody. Good boy. See how he's watching her now? Yeah. Oh, let's go. Let's go. The treats have nothing to do with it. Good, good. Good dog. Very nice. Very nice. Cute little underbite. Cute, yes, yes. Darling little big lip here. Canoody. Canoody. That's what I meant by body blocks. Do you guys do that? A little bit? So what I meant was, what I love to do, and some of you do this and some of you don't. So if you do this, this is like snore, just hang in there, okay? Because some people don't do it. Um, basically, the idea is that you're going to use space management and you're going to block the forward motion of a dog with your body without using, if at all possible, the leash. Good boy. Good boy. Oh, good boy. Good boy. Good boy. I do do this right away. Good boy. Good. Oh, good, 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 good dog. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Oh, I'm getting bored. Uh, where's mom? I don't think I'm going to reinforce you over here. Why not? Yeah, it's a great question. If you have a major forger, which actually he is. He is. <laughs> well, it works. Really. That's why I Because he forges. The the only the the exception I would make to that, you're getting worried about mom. He really is worried about mom. Is this? See how tight? Yes. And and see, I think part of getting this is is not just a treat. And maybe that's not true. I have this belief that if you, whew, <laughs> that you can do this too much. I have this belief that if you bend your knees and move this way that it has a profound effect on keeping them tight to you. Canoody. Uh-oh. Wait a second. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good dog. Good dog. Good dog. So I do that right away, but I'm really careful to bend my knees and turn this way. And I'm lowering him. So again, it's combining relevant ethological visual signals they're a cursorial predator. You get a great chase response, plus good operant conditioning. What would you do in that situation with a husky that doesn't care about food and continues to go outside the door? Oh, that dog. Yeah. What would you do about that dog? What would you do? Would you hold, since you know him for a second. What would you do about the husky? Yeah, he's really worried about mom. He knows Jim, so maybe he'll be a little better. What would you do about the husky who doesn't care about food? Oh, shoot. Well, there's a squeaky. I use a lot of squeakies on dogs who don't care about food. And usually the dogs who, quote, don't care about food do when you find the right food if they're not anxious. So say you get one of those dogs in class who no matter what you have, you have like a live mouse, you know, and it's not working. <laughs> you know, <laughs> honest, I don't use live mouse. Um, but you have something incredibly compelling and the dog won't touch it. Usually that means the dog's too anxious. That's a side effect of too much adrenaline production. That means the dog shouldn't be in that context. So that dog often gets private lessons rather than class. Are we, are we traumatizing Canuti? Yeah, I was, I was going to ask them to work this dog, but I'm not going to because I'm going to ask you to work the next dog, OK? He'll be more of a challenge. He'll be more of a challenge, Maggie? Yeah, yeah she'll be more. I'm going to have them work the dog after the break because I think we should stop right here, don't you? Hi, sweetie. Hi, sweetie. Okay, let me, would you take him out to mom? Yeah, yeah. And then, when he's out, everybody up and back at 10 after 3. Ready? Yeah. Woo! Are you ready? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Are you ready?
control like a girl. I do. It's true. I actually can't throw like that because of my back. So, but, but it's better because if I did throw like that, I'd really look like a girl. <laughs> I was terrible. Is anybody else terrible at sports? I was the girl in right field in elementary school going, please don't hit the ball to me, please don't hit the ball to me. Is, am I the only person who doesn't understand why you would stand underneath a fast-moving hard object? <laughs> what is it with balls? I, I mean, like, one would move away. Seems to be an adaptive response. Why would you stand under it with your face up? I don't get it. I don't get it. Wouldn't that be an interesting PhD? <laughs> I mean, really, it is actually fun. What is it about us and moving objects around in space? You take an object, and then you have to take it over there. And then you have to take it over there. And thus, a multi-billion dollar industry is born. I don't get it. I don't understand. OK. Oh, we have so much to do. We're, we're ending at 10 PM. <laughs> Right? Is that right? <laughs> How are you? Somebody's fanning. Are you okay? Is everybody all right? I had a little Coke. <laughs> I can't have too much, or I'll talk so fast you won't be able to hear me. And actually, if I have too much, do you, does anybody else monitor what they eat and drink when they work with dogs? Does anybody else get like overreactive if they drink too much caffeine? Do you? Yeah, she says. Coffee, no food. Oh, yeah, coffee, no food, lots of sugar, great combo, right? You know, nasty Dalmatian, bad <laughs> chemistry, you know? No sleep, lots of caffeine, Danish, <laughs> no real fuel, and a Dalmatian in your room. Oh, that's so rude. I'm so sorry. I say terrible breed things. No, I don't usually. I'm usually pretty good. Just as many wonderful Dalmatians as there are anything else out there. We have so much to do, I'm having to focus here. There were a couple of wonderful questions at break, really, really great questions. Who, and two of you I asked, there's one. That's right. Can I, can I say what you're going to say? Because I think I know where you're going and they can hear me. Is that OK? And if I get it wrong, tell me. But, well, he, he asked a wonderful question. He, he said, in the most gracious way he could, he said, could there, I mean, I, mean, I mean that really sincerely, he said, could there be a problem with selecting for this assertive behavior in border collies and a good pet dog? And it's a great question. It's a wonderful question. And I could talk about it for, uh, we are ending at what, 9.30? Is that what it is? Um, let me attempt to be concise, which is not my skill. Um, one, I don't think, as a matter of fact, I feel very sure, although there's no data, but I feel very, very confident there is no correlation between the way a dog herds livestock and how dominant or submissive or assertive it is around humans. There is just no correlation. You can get a dog who is very, very submissive, who is very pushy on livestock. You can have a dog who is shy around livestock but pushy around humans. All that, that, that's more rare. I don't think there's any correlation. I really, really don't. Um, I also don't think, and I didn't mention this, Excuse me, I have a little Coca-Cola. <laughs> Ladies, don't burp. <laughs> Did you get that on tape? <laughs> yes, she says. There's, I also don't think, and I'm really curious about what you guys have to say, I don't think there's a correlation between dogs who are dominant to other dogs and whether they're dominant or behave as status-seeking individuals towards humans. 
And I think it's really important to get that difference. I've talked to a lot of people who looked at, watch dogs play with other dogs and say, oh look, she's really dominant. And you take that puppy or that dog out to a bunch of people and, and you get an incredibly submissive individual. The two most dominant bitches that I have ever had were consistently submissive to people. They, you know, they, they were the reason bitch is a dirty word to dogs. <laughs> not, 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 I, not to the extreme. They never fought. They never fought, but Bess. Do you remember Bess, the, the female sniffing, another female with her tail, like you know, a Samoyed imitation kind of a thing? Yeah. Bess, Bess, Bess is one of those dogs, one of those females who, when a visiting intact female came to the farm, she picked up her favorite toy, she trotted over to the other female, and fool that I was, this was early on in my canine education, as she put it down in front of her, I said, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Oh, look at Betsy, she's sharing. <laughs> right? And I said, it just came out of my mouth. She put down the toy, the other dog sniffed it, she went, and I said, you bitch. <laughs> and I went, oh, that's why it's a dirty word. And then after I was done being appalled and shocked, I thought, you know, that was sort of cool. It's all done now, everything's done. She's a very dominant dog. She never was in a fight in her life because nobody ever challenged her. Everybody went, okay, fine, got it, no problem. <laughs> um, never ever was in a fight in her life. Extraordinarily submissive to people. So the question's a really good one, and I think there are cases where we can get in terrible trouble. I wonder, and maybe I'm just being chauvinistic, but I do wonder a lot about certain kinds of selection around people. So in confirmation, in obedience, people are selecting for this, right? I mean, how many times, you, I've been to confirmation shows, I don't know how many times I've heard the judge say, you had the best dog, but she didn't show well today, right? And I always ask them, and truly sincerely, would you explain to me why you, wh wh what you meant when you said that, because I thought the ribbon was about the standard, right? <laughs> you know? was about whether the dog fit the standard. And the dog, you said, fits the standard. And, and what show well means, we know what show well means, it's like, look at me, right? I mean, watch Westminster. It's like, hello, 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 hello. I'm a Yorkie, you know. <laughs> I'm cool. And, and I do wonder, and I just wonder, I don't know, but I wonder if we're selecting for very pushy individuals and that that is problematic. But I would only evaluate that when behaving with humans, not with a non-human species. Make sense? OK. Somebody else had a question. Yes? Oh, wow. The difference between temperament and attitude. Wow. I, yeah, 11, 12, midnight. I would have to think about that before I could give you a good answer. Um, I think sometimes they're the same, and I think sometimes they're different. I guess I would say attitude can be part, partly genetically, can be genetically mediated and therefore be related to temperament. I guess I can come up with an answer. That's, why, that's what PhD stands for, right? We all know, piled higher and deeper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Masters is more than, you know, BS is, you know what BS is, Bachelor's of Science, MS, MS, Masters is more of the same, PhD is piled higher and deeper. That's <laughs> what all those things stand for. <laughs> and you get rewarded for just sort of making stuff up on your feet and that sounds good. So, but I like this, I, it sounds good. Um, I think attitude can be, can be, driven by genetics or driven by learning and driven by experience. So I guess I would just say attitude is something you're seeing right then that you don't know the cause of. Whereas, whereas temperament, I would argue, is something that is, has a inherently genetically mediated content. Okay? Okay. Let's... Uh, I have a you to oh, good girl. Regarding the husky one on the outside... Oh, yeah, she had a great question. Yeah. 
Yeah, let, let me repeat that because I don't know that they all heard it. Um, it's all very fine to say you want to use your leash as little as you possibly can. And I really, really do encourage everybody to use a leash as little as they can. Doesn't mean you don't have to, right? But she asked the obvious question, what if you have a, a hyperforger? You know, what are you going to do if you can't turn in front of it fast enough? Um, what you do, and we'll, we'll try it with Maggie after we do a little, the first stuff we're going to do with Maggie, because she's going to jump up so much. That's why I picked her. We're going to work on jumping up in a second. That, that's all she's going to do for a minute. But after we, we get that worked on a little bit, we'll do a little heel forging with her. She's a little shelter puppy who just doesn't know nothing, you guys. She's just a great little blank slate for us to work on. And what you do, and I'll just tell you theoretically, and then we'll do it with some dogs, is you cannot turn in front of them if they're too far ahead of you. You turn in front of them, you know, and they're here, right? I mean, it just doesn't work. So what you do is, is you just do the turn away. Um, like, was it Annie you were doing? Somebody was doing, it was you were doing it. You just turn away, and now they're behind you. Cool. God, it's cool to be the smartest species, right? Now they're behind you. And you go this way, and as they start to come up to you, you turn in front of them. So that's, so that's what I do. Is it beautiful and gorgeous and elegant in the beginning? No, it looks like crap. <laughs> Does it work? Yeah, it works great. So I want to talk about jumping up now and body blocking. And we have got the jumper of all time. <laughs> Maggie is like major jumper. Um, so I'm going to borrow Maggie. How old is Maggie, Randy? How old is Maggie? Yeah. Ooh, the nose. <laughs> now you know I should have rewarded that. How old is she? I'm coming up on a year. Now. Coming up on a year. And what's the history? This is hard not to do anything to. I'm not sure. I have to ask Bridget. Do we know? I, you know, I, it might have said on her tag, is she a surrender stray? Pardon? She's five months old and I couldn't hear. Oh, she's an adoption return. You're a reject. Yeah, you are. So, learning. Teach this dog that she gets something good while she's sitting, right? Obvious learning. Ethology. If she starts to jump up on me, the common human response, as you know, is to do this. Pull away. What does this do? How do you teach come? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you good girl. Oh, and now she's going to nip heels. Good. Great. Far out. So, again, a body block. And I want you to pay attention to my torso because when you watch dogs, I don't have great videos of this, and if anybody does, please help me out. When you watch dogs manage space around other dogs, because I'm going to argue this afternoon that one of the primary ways that a dog maintains status in a pack is by this space management, what they use are shoulder slams and hip slams. They use their torso. Cut off your legs and arms. And what I tell people is if you want to push them away with your hand, which is what us chimps do, you know, I'm going to talk tomorrow about how we're, we, it's so helpful to look at wolf behavior to understand our dogs. We've gotten very good at that. But we need to be looking more at our ancestors. We need to be looking more at our genetic predispositions. We all forgive dogs for chewing, but we're not as generous to some of our clients sometimes, right? And what do we all want to do? We want to push dogs away with our hands. What do dogs do with their hand equivalents? They play. So you go, oh, I don't want to. Oh, I don't want you. you either get a nippy dog or you get a dog who keeps l jumping back, push away, jump back, push away. Of course, you're sitting perfectly now, <laughs> making everything I say look completely absurd. You're really cute. Does somebody want to a dog? This is just a really fun dog. Yeah. Wag your tail. Good girl. <laughs> good girl. <laughs> Maggie, good girl. Wag your tail. Good girl, good girl. We'll do wag the white part later. OK. OK, so when dogs are maintaining space, you can see a, bitches do this particularly before they go into heat. 
is they use hip slams and they use shoulder slams. They use their torso. And I have it from watching herding dogs. I have a belief that dogs transpose your body parts with their body parts. You know, I actually think if they could talk, they'd talk about our, our deformities, <laughs> which are quite serious. Have you noticed that we've never grown muzzles? Don't you think they lie around, you know? I wonder why they don't have any muzzles. Because <laughs> all adult mammals have muzzles. And this is actually a wonderful example of how we're juvenilized. We really are. We are actually juvenile chimpanzees. That's who you are. <laughs> you are just a not grown up chimpanzee. Chimpanzees have little muzzles. They're not very big, but they're much bigger than we have. We have baby faces. And we are juvenilized, and that's why we're so creative, and that's why we're so loving of risks and change, and that's why we're such jerks, because we're adolescents. And we never stop being like that. Hi, sweetie. And I think if dogs could talk, it's hard to keep letting this dog do this. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this on purpose, obviously. Um, I think if dogs could talk, they would sit around and say, you know, it's just too bad they don't have muzzles. I don't know what happened, but they make up for it. It's so dear with their little paws. <laughs> so I really think that they transpose everything except this. I think this they see as our muzzle equivalent. Uh-oh, found the goodie bag. <laughs> Took you a while, huh? Um, I wish this dog would focus, Randy. It's just... <laughs> Can't you get me a better? I just can't work with this dog. I just can't work with this dog. Uh, yeah, you're really cute. Want to come home to Wisconsin? I don't have cattle, but there are lots there. Yeah, there are. OK, so, so my, my jump up is, is a hip slam body block. And it works really well. <laughs> technique. <laughs> Maggie, good girl. Can you still see me? We have an obvious distraction here. Out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> Maggie, out of sight, out of mind. Good girl. So when they jump up, I just wanted to illustrate what we talked about before, is, is that I don't say off for the reasons I described. What I do is a hip slam, and basically I want to get, I want to meet them more than halfway. And that's what I tell my clients, is to meet your dog more than halfway. This isn't distracting or anything. I'm sure you're getting everything I'm saying, right? <laughs> is to meet your dog more than halfway. That's the ethology, and then use the learning to teach, ah, oh, good puppy, good puppy. I talk a lot to dogs by the good puppy. So as she starts to jump up, I'm just going to see it. Boop, boop, boop. And what happens is the cue can become good puppy, good puppy, good girl, good girl. Oh, good puppy, good puppy. She's, she, she's one of those. Klingon dogs, you know? She's like, she's up there and she wants to stay up there. Good puppy. And you have, those are a little harder to work with because once they're there, by the way, it's harder to work with. Oh, do you want to do shoulder slams for me? So, so Randy's going to have her jump up and rather than pushing her away with your paws, which is what we humans want to do, he's going to turn his torso around, keep his hands in towards his belly and push this way. Dogs understand that. That's part of dog communication. You're speaking dog when you do that. Perfect. Good girl. Here. Whoa. Take a treat. I, Randy, I want to give you a treat in your hand because we, we've got two. There you go. Yes. Yes. Good. Good, good. Well, she was divided. Her focus was divided, right? But he was doing it exactly how I do it. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. 
And what happens is that starts disappearing. See how little you need? Piggy. See that? Did you get it? Maggie. See how little I leaned? Right? I'm giving her a relevant visual signal. Good girl. And then obviously that, that secondary signal just drops out. Good girl. Piggy. Sit. Good girl. So I love it in AKC composition. They say you can only use two signals. It's like, ha, huh, you can use 47 that nobody can see. You know? <laughs> Just make them subtle enough. Sit. Maggie, come. Sit. Good girl. Maggie, sit. Good girl. Did this dog know this before, Randy? <laughs> Promise? OK, good girl. And Trish calls these uh, mouse on sticks. My mouth on sticks. Mouth on sticks. <laughs> Trish King calls these dogs mouth on sticks. <laughs> oh, the hands. Oh, I didn't get it. I was a little slow. That's, I love that. That's great. Can I use that? <laughs> I love that, Trish. That's really good. A mouth on a stick. That's perfect. Yes. Herself. No, the, she was barking at herself on the screen. Who was then barking back at her. So she piloted and she piloted. It was great. Wasn't that great? Very reactive to another dog. But you know, another thing to think about, where was that other dog? Incredibly high. I'm going to talk about height in just a second. Very important in dog ethology. Oh, it's a great question. How do you translate this body language to people of all ages and skills? Well, it's just like all of dog training. How do you teach consistency to people, you know? You know, we just do our best and we tear our hair out a lot. I have actually found that this takes less motor finesse than many, many other signals. It's also nonverbal. Um, the hardest thing of really young kids who are scared of dogs, and they go, ah! You know, and they weigh those little baits on sticks at that point, you know, ah, you know, ah. Um, but I've actually found it relatively easy to teach compared to a lot of the, I mean, like teaching healing, I think, is incredibly difficult. I think it's hard for the dog. I think it's hard to teach a human. I think it's hard to learn it. I think it's really tough stuff. Teaching a body block is actually relatively easy. It's also one of the safest things that I've done with dogs who can be status-related aggressive. Much less chance of getting in trouble if you control a dog with this than if you take your hand and reach towards it. Much, much, much less trouble. So let's, I want to talk about, um, I see somebody who's just giving great visual signals. I'll take one question and then I'm going to talk about status and visual signals and that whole great controversy of dominance. Yes, absolutely. She's saying, what if you're face to face with a dog and you're sort of stuck there? Can you use the reverse of that? I use the reverse of that all the time. I work, in, I work with dogs who bite. That's mostly what I do. It's what happens when you become a behavior consultant. It's, 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 it's what happens, you know? So it's sort of like being an oncologist, because then you start working with the worst cases. So I'm in a little room, and I'm taking the history of like, how many stitches? You know, and I, I love Ian's um, description of talking with Carol Benjamin about, about her work. And, and he said, what, do you, what is the first thing you ask somebody whose dog is aggressive? And she said, I ask them where they bite. And he said, you mean like in the kitchen? or the?" And he said, no. I ask them what body part I need to protect. <laughs> they're quite faithful. They're, they're not, they're not, it's not always true, but they're quite faithful, aren't they? You know, yes, <laughs> you say from old experience, right? Shepherds love forearms. 
They just love forearms. They just really do. We all know we're healers, you know, duh. Doxies like lips. And some of the scariest dogs, the dogs that I really, 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 really don't like are the ones who like midriffs. I have an acquaintance. I have actually a very good friend who has a, 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 a good friend whose left breast was bitten off by a husky. So, so whenever somebody comes in with a husky who's very, very aggressive, I say hi. <laughs> Where does he bite? <laughs> I just, this is, you know, I don't mind my face, and I don't want to hear. And, um, you had a question. I've totally lost what it was. Oh, it was a great question. Can you use the reverse? And I use it in this little room with these biting dogs all the time. You got a dog who's like, rah, 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 at you. And this is how I greet a dog I don't know who I always presume has bitten. You just get conditioned. I now presume all, dog has, all dogs have mutilated everybody. You just, you just, you just get conditioned to that. And I greet um, a dog. There's a dog. I'll just demo it with no dog. Um, if that's my dog, rather than walking up this way, I stand still. I go slightly sideways. But you know, I've noticed in me coaching people to stand sideways, some people do it too much. So I do a tiny bit, do you agree? I do a tiny bit of sideways. I have my weight on my back foot. I do not lean back like this. And I, I actually was working with somebody not too long ago who had heard all of my um, weight shifting, you know, don't go forward, go backwards, be sideways, don't look directly at them. And I'm going to exaggerate what she did, but we went into the house of somebody whose dog was aggressive to visitors, and I thought it was because of fear-related issues. And, and she went in sort of like this. <laughs> and the dog just went off on her. Just rah, 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 start growling at her. And, and the owner was like, well, uh, people uh, usually don't come in like that. <laughs> and don't you think you can do it too much? I think it's really important to do it just a little bit subtly. So there are a lot of times I get a dog who's, who starts something or who particularly is fearful, and I will keep my weight on my back foot. The trick is, is to read that dog, whether you get some dog who's making one of those status-seeking little testy challenges like the U was and starts at you. Are you going to go back at it and stop, or are you going to give to it? And that's just, you just have to make a decision based on all those miles of experience you've had and how gutsy you feel that day and how much coke you've had, you know? <laughs> so, so let me talk about dominance. I should get back here. <laughs> This, this, this dominance topic is great and awful. It's great and awful because it's very important and it's causing all kinds of trouble. I really think it's causing all kinds of trouble. There's some people who just think the whole concept is just, just irrelevant, just absolutely relevant. And I don't agree with that. I'm an ethologist. And people who've been studying ethology and animal behavior have spent a really long time looking at social systems in many, 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 many species and have spent many, 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 many years, hundreds of them, trying to decide how animals get along in groups and how to describe that and how to understand that. And what they have come to is understanding that in some social species in which animals have to act cooperatively yet have the ability to hurt each other, and may have to compete with each other. There's a system of social, there's a social system that works, which is to have a hierarchy, which basically simply means that if there is a limited resource, a preferred limited resource, then, and you have two individuals who both want it, those individuals do not have to fight it out every time to decide who gets that limited resource. That's what dominance is, and that's all it is. Dominance is priority access to preferred limited resources. That's what it is, and that's all it is. Now, when I say that's all it is, does that mean, well, it's not very important? It's really important. It's really, really important, and I think it would be a tragedy to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I talked to, um, you might know Pam Reed. She's a psychologist, she has a PhD, she's just great. I think she does great stuff. 
Um, and she doesn't like this whole concept of dominance. Jean, I don't think you're that fond of this concept. Yeah, she's like this on it. So you know, I'll work on Jean. You know, we'll work on each other some. Um, and and there, there, there's a perspective that everything an animal does is because of learning. And there's a perspective that a lot of what animals do is because of their sort of natural history and ethology. And I'm very much that it's all a combination of all those things. So I don't think it's useful to throw the concept of dominance out because it's been misunderstood. And that was the talk that Pam and I had. She said, I don't use the concept of dominance, Tricia, because people, don't not, people have been misusing it. And I said, I agree with you people are misusing it. But is that a reason to throw it out? Maybe that would be a reason to clarify what it really is. So I think you all, this is a very highly educated group. I don't need to tell you that dominance is not force. Force is the lack of power, right? If I had total power, I would say, hello, lovely lady with the coolest color lipstick in the world. Could I please have $500 now, right? And if I had total power, she would have to give me $500. If I didn't, and I really wanted it, I would maybe try threatening her, and then I would, <laughs> <laughs> give me the money, right? And I would threaten her with physical harm, and maybe I would beat her up some, and then she would finally come out with $500. Force is the absence of power. Power is not a bad thing. Power is one of the ways that individuals in competitive social systems get stuff figured out without having to hurt each other every time to get it done. The problem, I think, with, with having a hair on your tongue, <laughs> don't you hate that? Problem with, with, I think, a lot of the use of dominance is that it's been confounded with aggression. Dominance has nothing to do with aggression. Dominance has nothing to do with force. I've heard people say outrageous things like I mentioned earlier, don't ever play bow because that's getting into a submissive posture. That's just, that's just silly. You know, that's just silly. Luke play bows all the time. Look at Tulip. Tulip is the alpha bitch of my farm without question. You know? Um, dominance get to decide what is preferred. That's one of the things that's, that's not that's not understood. I was talking to um, a behaviorist, a really great one, who said, John Wright, Dr. John Wright, who, who, and he and I just have a ball talking with each other. We don't agree with each other, and we just love it. You know, he's one of those really stimulating people. He's got a great mind. And we we're talking about this whole concept of dominance, and he said, he said, you know, it's just, it's just absurd to talk about dominance because, because if, 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 if I was dominant over my dog, I would eat their dog food. No, you wouldn't. Not unless you want it, John. You know? No, you wouldn't, because dominance get to decide. The highest status individual of the pack gets to decide what's important to them. Did you see Luke let, I mean, it was a pretty hard to see. Could you see in that terrible video, could you see Luke letting the puppies eat his dinner? He didn't care. He doesn't care that much about food. What he really cares about is sheep and ball. But he will also grant puppy rights to puppies to take his ball away. He really, really will. What he would never do is allow one of those puppies to mount him and try to copulate with him. He would growl and, and get them off of him. Okay? He has certain priorities that are very important to him, but he gets to grant favors whenever he wants them. So one of the things to get about dominance is that you only see it expressed at certain times. Um, it's not the same between with, with dogs and, and people, they're not dis dominant dogs don't display, quote, dominant postures all the time. And, and let me just talk for a second about what a dominant dog is. There is really no such thing biologically. Um, there are status-seeking dogs. And there are dogs who, who are dominant in that context. But haven't you had a dog who, who has control over something in the house and loses that control over something else in the yard. So you get one dog who has control over something they want in the yard, and one dog who has control over something they want in the house. That happens. It's a question of priority, priorities and limited resources. But there's always going to be one thing that they both want, right? And that's how you, how you sort of ultimately figure it out. 
high status individuals, and I do believe that, that as I said before, there are, there are a genetic predisposition to want to be a high status individual versus not. Real high status individuals are not necessarily exhibiting that at all times. And you get, haven't you heard that? If you do any behavioral counseling, I know you've heard this a million times. But he's so good 98% of the time. <laughs> but he's great 95% of the time. And it's actually, it's, it's, I feel so sorry for them because here's like the perfect dog. Literally 98%, probably more, probably more like 99.99% of the time, except for the 47 stitches they put in their arm. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer, do you know Jeffrey Dahmer? He was from Milwaukee, so he's like, you know, a native son. <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer was nice all day long at the chocolate factory. He was just fine. It was that little percentage on a couple of evenings that was a problem, right? So when you get this expressed normally in a way that's not too yucky to even us have us want to pursue and contemplate too much more, um, when you get a normal expression of status, you only actually see it expressed rarely if everything is settled, if, if individuals within a social hierarchical system understand who's who. Let me tell you a little bit about Zyman's research. Do you know about Dr. Zyman? He's got a wonderful chapter called Socioethology, Socioethogram of Wolves. It's in a huge book called Wolves of the World. It's very expensive. Don't buy it. Go to the library and read his chapter on socioethograms of wolves. It's fascinating research. He spent years and years with wolves looking at their social system. And he, one, of, one, of, one of the many things he focused on was status and what that really meant. And what he found was, unlike the linear pecking order of a chicken, which is where this whole concept of dominance started, it was very linear. So, so you know how it went. If chicken A, if you put corn between chicken A and chicken B, chicken A would check it, peck at chicken B, this is hard to say, would peck at chicken B and get the corn. And then you could put B and C together, and, and let's say that B was over C. If that was true, you knew that A was over C. It was a very linear, sim relatively simple, predictable hierarchy. Although I know a woman, Dr. Joy Mitch, who works with chickens, and I just feel obligated to tell you that she feels they are the world's most interesting, complicated, <laughs> fascinating animals, and you all should have one. <laughs> so I will tell Joy that I said that, and then I'll move on to the world's most interesting, complicated animal, the dog. Um, what Zyman found was not linear at all. What he found is that if you look at the social hierarchy in a wolf pack, there are actually three categories. There's the alpha. We all know about the alpha. There's the pack leader. You do know that there's an alpha male and an alpha bitch, right? They're separate. There is, this is gender related. That's why those really nasty, ugly, dog dog aggression status related fights are always between gender. You get a lot of fights between males and females, but they're rarely, and then they're sometimes about status. There are always exceptions, right? But the most common, really nasty status related fight is between, well, the worst nasty one is between two females, as we know. Um, and sometimes you get nasty fights between males also. There's an alpha male. He's dominant. He has higher status over all the other males. There's an alpha female. Now, how do they work together? Well, they often just finesse it. Tulip is alpha male. Luke is alpha, uh, Tulip is alpha female. Luke is alpha male. They don't get in conflicts. They stay out of it. And that's one of the things that I think it's really important to get is that natural confident alphas use as little force as possible. They don't want to fight. There's nothing biologically helpful about fighting. Tulip and Luke just don't get into it. If I put a bone between the two of them, I swear to you, one of them would say, I don't see anything. I'm not giving up on that, but I don't see it, because I'm going to keep peace in the valley. You know? Um, gender, alpha male. Let's talk about the alpha male hierarchy first. 
There's only one in the alpha category. There are three categories. There's only one. There can only be one leader, right? There's a second category under that that can contain many individuals. It's the beta category. I call it the alpha wannabe category. That's the category of individuals who would like to be leader of the pack. They're Henry Kissinger. They're, they're the ones with, with the ear of the throne. They're the ones who suck up to alpha because if Alpha dies, they want to be in the right position. They want to position themselves to be in the right place to turn into Alpha. They're middle management. Talk to any sociologist. Where is the conflict in middle management? I mean, where is the conflict in an organization? Gosh, you'll never guess now what I'm going to say. <laughs> it's in middle management. That's where the nasty stuff happens. It really, really is. If you have a natural, confident Alpha, then very often, there's, there's, you, you never see any expression of force or aggression, but you see this roiling behavior in the beta category. Then there's a third category, and it includes puppies and juveniles and young adults, but it also includes perfectly mature, old, middle-aged, reproductively viable adults who just don't want to be president. It's PIP. PIP is never going to be an alpha wannabe. Pip doesn't want to be, I don't want to be president. Do you want to be president? No. I don't want to be, I don't want that responsibility. And there are a lot of individual dogs, I would argue to you, that don't want that responsibility either. Now, thinking about this morning, what is the worst problem dog that you can get? It's the one who is status seeking, I really, 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 really want to be in charge, but I'm really, 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 fearful and insecure and unconfident. That's the ultimate alpha wannabe, and that's the dog who causes the most trouble. We call them bullies. Because one of the things the, worth, the wolf researchers will tell you, and I've talked to a lot of them. I have never done research on wolves myself, but I know a lot of people who have. I talk to them at Animal Behavior Society meetings a lot, and every one of them says consistently, the thing you need to get about an alpha wolf is that so much of how they behave towards the, toward the other individuals is a function of their individual personality. You get despotic alphas who rule by terror. You, you know, you, 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 you get um, Mussolini. <laughs> and there are benevolent, confident alphas who everybody wants to sit beside, who never use force, who never intimidate, who are benevolent and unreactive. Temperament or personality has a profound effect on what the pack is like. But that's separate from who wants to be status seeking or not. So a lot of what people call a dominance problem, I would argue, and I think this is what they really mean. I don't want to be too picky. But just be really clear in your head. If somebody talks about a dominance problem, what you well might be talking about is, is, is a dog who is a status seeking individual who is not clear in its hierarchy and maybe is very insecure about it. I think there are dogs who just, it's so important to them. Haven't you met dogs who it's just like, I have got to be pack leader. I've met two dogs, both of whom were euthanized, who just ran your blood cold. You know, you came in, um, you did something. One, I reached for an object once, the other was, a, was, was a, just a beginning of a, a little tester body block and their eyes just went cold and hard. We'll talk about cold eyes tomorrow. And, 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 and I see a lot of that, but you know the end of the extreme where you just go, oh, serial killer, you know? I had a 12-week-old wolf hybrid puppy bite me, and I'll never forget the face on this individual. Amy was in there. I will never forget the face that Amy was like, wow! Never forget the face on this individual 12-week-old puppy when he bit my hand. It was the most hateful look I have ever, I just, it was the first time I ever thought, you are evil, you know? And it wasn't that he bit me, oh, believe me, that counts. <laughs> I don't like that. But it was the look on his face, it was the most evil look, hateful look I've ever seen on an animal, and it was one of two times that I said, not, you need to discuss alternatives, there are always three, one is treatment, one is placement, one is euthanasia. It was one of two times in 11 years that I've said, my strong advice is to euthanize this dog. 
Usually, I mean, I might make that leaning suggestion. I was very, very clear. So there are individuals, I think, who would literally rather die than not be leaders. And my, and, and my answer is, OK, <laughs> your choice. <laughs> yes, you get to. Mm. Is that what we call a fear biter? No. I'm talking specifically not about a fear biter. I'm talking about a, looks, a dog who looks at you and says, F you, who's not afraid at all, who is a really high status dog, who is, is not afraid and is not insecure. And we'll, we're going to look at a lot of videos and slides tomorrow that help, help evaluate, is there a fear component to this? Is, there, is this confidence? Is this status? What is this all about? But I think it's most common for a dog who's status seeking, who's in that beta category, where most of our dogs live, by the way. You know, people talk about, well, that dog is dominant over them. I don't think they usually are dominant over their human. I think there are very do few dogs who live in a family who think they're the alpha. If they're the alpha, how come we can only open the door? How come we have all the food? Right? I think the problem is, is that they're the top of the beta category and they're trying to make a move, <laughs> you know? So it's about status, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a dominant dog. Can you use learning in relation to, oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I teach my dogs? It's really fun to be deferential and submissive. Let me teach you how cool it is to back up. Let me teach you how cool it is to defer to another dog to get what you want. Let me teach you how fun it is to roll over on your belly. It's just really cool down there, you know? And I'm never going to use force on you. Um, I would never say never. I'm rarely going to use force on you. I will sometimes give a physical correction. I, would, I, I don't know how you raise dogs 100% without physical corrections. But, but I don't do it very often. So I think the big problem dogs are the alpha wannabes. I mean, that's my basic message. And I need to actually, Amy, could you bring me a leader of the pack booklet? I should have got one. Status-related component. Did you like that visual signal? Person put up hand, or she went like, yeah, well, I really want to attend to you, but I don't have time right now. Lovely response, very, very good response to my subtle signals. She went, yeah, I got it, okay. Um, I'll come back to you, okay. A lot of behavioral problems, I believe, have status-related components to them. Does that mean it's all there is? No. It's very rare that it's just about this or just about that. I mean, most of the problem dogs I see who have really serious behavioral problems, they're ambivalent. It's partly fear, it's partly status, it's partly learned, it's partly this, it's partly that. It's, it's very rare that it's so simple. But often there is a status-related component. If there is, one of the things that I suggest people do, it's called a status reduction program. I have a little booklet called Leader of the Pack. It's over here, over on the table where Amy and Denise are. This leader of the pack is very small. It's a tiny little booklet. I love it because you can give it to clients and they'll read it. <laughs> you know, it's short, it's sweet, it's concise, and I don't think it can get anybody in any trouble. Does it work? I don't know. I think so. Has anybody done good research on it? No. Should somebody, PhD, I told you. Here's another one, number five, right? Another PhD waiting to happen. Anecdotally, clinically, in terms of my experience, I have a very large number of people come to me and say, I didn't do everything in that booklet, because we're all human, right? But I did these things, and you know what? Everything's OK now. So does that mean this helped? I don't know. Sure seems like it sometimes. Does this help everything? No. This is often just the foundation. All this is, and this is not all new, by the way. I did not make this up. Terry Ryan has a really good one called Alphabetizing Your Dog. Have you seen that? Pardon? Great booklet. Great booklet. Alphabetizing Your Dog. Another great booklet on this, this basic same status reduction program. Basically, it goes through what we know that dogs do to maintain their status in a hierarchy. So the first thing it talks about, for example, you've heard the no free petting. You know, the step number one is no free petting. And what that is about is all that's about in terms of ethologically. Obviously, in terms of learning, it's obvious. Your dog learns that it can demand from you and get attention from you. This can be a problem, right? Certainly a frustration and tolerance problem. Ethologically, what this is about is that we know 
If you look at a wolf pack, you can tell who the alpha is by who creates behavioral change. I'm alpha here today because I get to say when the brakes are, right? You may be wanting a behavioral change right now. I would predict you are. Hot, get tired, right? You're probably getting a little hot. It's four o'clock. You've been sitting forever. But no, you're doomed because I'm up here talking and I, you know, right? And I have more status than you do and you're just stuck. Poor babies. That sounds just awful, doesn't it? There's going to be a rebellion in a minute. Um, you guys okay? Now, I feel, now I'm worried about you. <laughs> you guys all right? Is everybody okay? Okay, okay, okay. Not, no, they're more than that. They're, they're a pack of wolves trotting single file through the snow. And, and the person I saw giving this presentation, it was a wolf conference in Duluth. Um, it was an associate of Meech, after, uh, actually, David Meech, said, OK, who's the alpha? And everybody went, the one in the lead. And he said, no. Who's the alpha? Just keep watching. Trot, 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 trot. The third one back stopped pulled over to the side and started to lick her paws. Within 60 seconds, all the other wolves had stopped and started grooming themselves. Within X number of minutes, guess who started trotting away again? It was the same individual. It was the alpha female, who often gets to choose the direction, by the way. Actually chooses where to go hunting, very typical female mammal. Social system is often the female that, that certainly true with sheep. Um, very typical that alphas sort of split different jobs from the male and the female. So one of the things we know about dominant or alpha person, alpha types, alpha individuals, is that they create behavioral change. So it's really important that your dog can't stop you from what you're doing. You're watching TV, your dog comes up and nudges you, and you go, oh, sweetie, did you want to walk, you know? Right? Oh, honey, did you want to play ball? And you just start doing that over and over and over again. What is your dog going to think? I mean, who is in charge? You would never let a kid do that. And one of the things I, I love to talk to, to people have, about is, is the relationship between dogs and kids. You know how people say, oh, I love my dog so much, I treat him just like my kid. No, you don't, is what I say to them nicely and generously. Would you let your kid sit on your head like that? You know, there's like a... There's like a Pekingese up here going, <laughs> and they're going, <laughs> I said, would you let your child sit on your head like that? No. Would you let your little kid come up and go, mommy, mommy, I want an ice cream, mommy, I want an ice cream cone, mommy, mommy, mommy. No. You know, if we're going to raise dogs to be part of our family, then we need to raise them to learn to sort of fit into our family, whether you want to call it hierarchy or manners or whatever you want to call it. Kids don't get to demand that you stop talking to your friend Margaret when you're on the phone. And neither should dogs. So that's what that no free petting is about. It's not mean. It's not cruel. It's very hard to do. It's awful. I hate it. Do I do this every day with all my dogs? Not a chance. Not a minute. I do this if I think I'm about to have a problem. You know, if I, I, at one point I had Misty, my, I called her my psycho dog. Lovingly, I called her my psycho dog. Major dog-dog aggression problem. I'm so proud that she never hurt another dog for the last nine years of her life. Died a natural, well, she died of cancer. Um, is that natural? I don't know. But, but she, didn't, she didn't, I kept her out of trouble, and she was bad, you guys. I'm really proud of how I managed that dog. And she, you'll see videos of her tomorrow. She'd get the evil eye. She'd start looking at Lassie like prey, you know, or worse, another bitch right before Esther season was starting or something. Um, and, and then I would start this, and I would start it with Misty. So it's, it's no free petting. It's a lot of space management stuff. It's teaching body blocks. It's wait at the door. And it's also practicing lookaways. You guys all know lookaways? If you're old enough, you know it from Jack Benny. It's a well. <laughs> One of the things if, if that, that I want to talk about lookaways, um, and I know some people talk about them as a calming signal. I, I find that whole work of, and I, for, I forget to pronounce her name right. Turret. 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 Thank you. I always say it wrong, and I'm afraid I'm going to say it 
wrong in a bad way, Turid. Um, <laughs> Turid, Turid I, I, I'm just fascinated by her stuff. I, as, as a biologist, I don't, I don't put everything in the same category she does, but I think it's just brilliant how she's gotten people looking at all these different signals. It's really important, and the look away is a really important one. But I want you to make a distinction. Because in both human ethology and canid ethology, there's a look away and there's a look away. So in human ethology, let, let, let me give you the two examples. <laughs> right? Versus. Now, what did I just convey to you? What, what is this? <laughs> Disdain. Disgust. Superiority, good. And what does this convey? Shame, Shame submission. humility, submission, right? So pay a lot of attention. If you're going to do a look away to your dog, are, are you up or are you down? And if you want to do one in relation to, I use, it, I use this as a correction, by the way, a lot. My dog does something really awful. When it, when, my, my favorite correction right now is to use a whole combination of things. Part of this is from Ian Dunbar. Part of this is from heaven only knows who else. But if a dog does something I hate, I'm going to get down here and correct a dog out there, OK? But it's not going to be a real dog. So say, say my little dog here just <laughs> did, did the good dog. <laughs> just did, just, oh, tried to start a fight with another dog. I never tolerate dog fights, ever. They just do not occur at my house, because I'm alpha bitch and I get to say so. Um, so say, say Misty, my psycho dog, started to attack Lassie. This would be, and this is Misty right down here. Can you guys see? You can't see anything. OK. Oh, that's OK. I'm sorry. I didn't know you had to work so hard. It's all right. I can just do it. All I want you to just, just imagine that I'll just do it right here. OK, here's bad dog. Bad dog. OK, here's my correction. Big body block with a growl, right? What are you doing? Cut that up. And then I stop. I don't go at her. I don't grab her. I don't attack her. I don't get defensive aggression. I stop. And I turn away because I want to deflect this rage I'm about to, and this insanity that I'm about to impart so that I don't get any defensive or even any fear or defensive aggression. And then I throw a fit. So I guess I should stand here. What are you doing? Oh, I can't believe. This is Ian. Ian taught me. Can't believe you do this. What are you thinking? And meanwhile, they're like. <laughs> now, this wouldn't work with some dogs, right? Well, you know, certain reactive dogs would like to be, ooh, ooh I should bite her. <laughs> you know, you do this with a, with a sound sensitive relatively submissive border collie, and they're not all submissive, right? As we all know. You do that with a real sensitive border collie, and they're like, oh, God, what? Oh. But I'm over here. I'm not going at my dog. And then I go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, and I did a whole bunch of things. One is I did a raised chin look away, and it was really abrupt. And I also gave a disgust vocalization that Darwin talks about in the 1800s. So this is not new stuff at all. Darwin talks about this universal expression of disgust. <laughs> and he has pictures in the 1860s of a whole range of species of mammals going, uh, if they're disgusted. It's a great book. Universal expression of emotion in animals and man. Uh, uh. And I have this belief that dogs can read it. Uh, uh, uh. And, and they're not on defense, but they're like, what, what, what? And then they're on a downstay. And if it was dog-dog aggression, they're both on a downstay. Because I don't ever want them to learn that the way you get rid of another dog is to be aggressive. You know, so Miss used to be on downstays for five hours in the living room with Lassie until she stopped jaw chattering. <laughs> and she would calm down and stop looking like that. And when she did and her internal state changed, then I would say, okay, now you can go. That's the way you get rid of Lassie. Okay? 
So that's, that's sort of, that's a combination of, of, again, of learning an ethology and this look away. It's, it's very important that you know how you're doing it because chin up or chin down makes a huge difference. There's some other space management in here that um, talks about play. So how many of you say don't ever play tug of war? Huh? The big tug of war controversy? What do you guys say here at Marin County? Always win. Mm. What about off? Yes, have an off switch. I used to say, don't ever play tug of war, because when I started out, that's what everybody said when I read it. And I don't ever say that anymore either. Do you think it's time for me to quit? <laughs>